started. So next, uh, what we can do is look at uh, the jets, um, not as single objects, but in terms of their constituents. Um, one thing that that has allowed us to do, actually many times over the last uh, 10 years, is to find where this lost energy actually goes. And without going through all the measurements, in broad terms, they come all to the same conclusion that the energy that is lost in the cone is balanced by low PT um, constituents out to very large angles in this uh, CMS measurement uh, out to uh, two units, uh, two radian distance from the jet axis. And uh, I mean, one of the most detailed measurements was recently done by, by Atlas. And this is also similar to conclusions that were reached at, uh, at RIC here in this measurement by the Phoenix uh, collaboration. So this uh, tells us that uh, um, while our operational definition of a jet only concerns what, uh, what is the outcome of the clustering algorithm, there are actually many particles outside uh, of the jet that are not part of the clustered energy, but that are also correlated uh, with the parton shower uh, as, it, um, evol as it evolves in the medium. So again, it is important to distinguish between the jet that is reconstructed and uh, the actual object, the uh, physical object of the, of the parton shower and everything that is correlated with the evolution of this object. And this, of course, uh, this has, uh, is uh, at the heart of uh, um, efforts to describe this uh, in, as medium transport, which takes this uh, energy that is radiated to large energies and then evolves it in the evolution or co-evolves it in the evolution of the medium to see how it actually ends up at these uh, large angles. Okay, um, let me say one more word uh, on fragmentation functions which, as I said, is sort of the longitudinal along the jet axis distribution of the momentum of the jet amongst the constituents. They are really nice measurements by um, uh, ATLAS and, and CMS and uh, other experiments. Although the statistics is uh, uh, still somewhat crappy, in particular when you look at jets where you can get the events where you can get the cleanest information with a photon tag. Um, one thing that you see that uh, there is an enhancement in this uh, in this ratio of uh, lead lead to PP, there's an enhancement at low PT, and there's an enhancement uh, at high PT uh, for inclusive jets, not uh, for the photon jets. This plot is a little bit confusing, so here's my cartoon version of it. I have an enhancement at uh, low C, uh, meaning low PT particles, that is seen in inclusive and photon jet events. Uh, but at high PT, um, there's a difference. It's a, you have a more or less constant suppression, except for this one atlas point that the CMS doesn't see, where and an enhancement uh, in the inclusive jets, which atlas always sees, uh, CMS uh, only sees with large uh, uncertainties. Um, one thing that is exciting about this is that you expect some difference here because uh, these inclusive jets are mostly initiated by gluons. The photon jets are mostly initiated by quarks. And uh, this is actually uh, seems to be reflected in a change in the fragmentation pattern, both in a shift in PT of the, uh, of the onset of the low PT enhancement and the difference in the high PT uh, behavior. So I think this uh, really, uh, we should work hard to understand this in, in more detail. And um, maybe that's a sign of the elusive, to some extent quark gluon energy loss difference that should be there and that I think would give me a, a lot of confidence that we know what we're doing if we could actually identify that conclusively. Um, one reason that I'm, I'm really anxious to achieve that finally is, for example, this recent, recent uh, CMS measurement, which, which looks at the, uh, the charge of jets, which should uh, reflect the charge of the initiating, um, uh, or the flavor of the initial initiating pattern. This is the definition. So you sum over all the track constituents with some uh, exponent kappa here um, and uh, their charge uh, Q. Uh, this gives distributions like this, a sort of standard technique in PP to look at the uh, uh, quark gluon uh, balance. You do the same thing in, uh, in lead lead and to, uh, I think at least my big surprise, you don't see really a, a difference. Now caveat here is that the templates that are used to distinguish between the different flavors, they come from Puthia. So this has to be treated with some skepticism. However, the distributions or the little black dots that you can see here, they just uh, look uh, very similar. So the question is, is this a, an indication that uh, 
quarks and gluons have the similar probability to survive, or is it uh, just an, uh, an, uh, a balance of uh, counteracting effects that uh, this uh, jet charge cannot, um, cannot distinguish? Eh? So it's uh, really something that needs to be followed up with uh, database templates and um, uh, would be nice to study this in, uh, in photon uh, uh, or C-jet events, which needs much more statistics. Okay. Somehow we still haven't quite managed to settle the question of uh, quark and uh, gluon uh, uh, quenching differences seen in the data. Okay, so now I want to come to the final uh, data topic. Uh, so I guess I will need to run over time a little bit, but hopefully not too much. And that is jet uh, substructure. So now we look at uh, the constituents of the jets, but not in terms of uh, individual particles, but in terms of uh, constituents clustered into uh, subjets. Um, so there are a couple of key techniques there. One is reclustering, where we take the constituents that were found, say, by anti-KT, and we take the same constituents, but recluster them with a different uh, 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 jet algorithm that gives us better access to the, to the sequence of splitting uh, events that led to the uh, structure, the subject structure of the, of the event. So reclustering. Once we have reclustered, one thing that we can do is we can uh, apply a grooming procedure that gets rid of some of the soft stuff that uh, um, may be confusing to, to, uh, uh, in some of the comp uh, comparisons and only uh, retains sort of the hard substructure of the event in terms of uh, uh, subjects. Um, for this grooming procedure that can, uh, you can both have cuts on the momentum and you can make that on the momentum fraction carried by these subjects. And you can make that cut uh, dependent on where in angle uh, these uh, subjects lie or what the angular uh, difference between the subjects is. This is this uh, angle theta here, which you can then put uh, to various uh, powers. There are many measurements. I'll just go through some of them quickly and then I'll sum, try to summarize where we stand with that. Um, first, let me re uh, remind you, what is the motivation? Well, if I manage to uh, identify these uh, subjects, then uh, the hardest ones, I can to some approximation um, uh, relate to the hardest and maybe earliest uh, splitting of the parton shower in its evolution through vacuum or its evolution in the quark gluon plasma. So the this subjects and their correlations may provide a window into the evolution of the parton shower. And in comparing PP and uh, lead lead, I may be able to see how is that evolution modified by uh, the quark gluon plasma. Um, here's a study from the EMI workshop last year. This uh, again was done by, by uh, Yanji Li and Yi Chen, where we look at the uh, um, the KT of between the two subjects uh, after heteronization and after underlying event subtraction, of course, in the model, uh, Puthia, and we compare that to uh, the hardest uh, splitting KT uh, in, in the part on history in Puthia. So this is a, a final state observable. This is something that is invisible in the experiment. And you see that there is, well, there's a lot of noise, but there is also a clear correlation in particular, if you go to uh, harder splits, there's a good correlation there. Whether this correlation fully survives also uh, all detector effects um, and uh, remains to be studied. I think this is uh, very difficult, but uh, this plot at least suggests that it's not hopeless, which is uh, um, an, an, uh, a necessary condition for continuing with this. Okay, so let's look at uh, some of the measurements. Um, this is one of the earliest ones. It's a measurement of this, uh, uh, how the, the distribution of this uh, um, splitting function CG, um, the ratio of uh, the, between the, the smaller um, jet PT, lower jet uh, subjet PT to their sum is modified. Um, how are the yields modified as a function of CG? And you see that in heavy ion collisions compared to PP, balanced uh, subjects, uh, there's a smaller yield of uh, balanced subjects uh, relative to uh, unbalanced ones. Um, what that suggests, I mean, first of all, that you have a dependency and suggests that uh, this early splittings are actually resolved by the quark gluon plasma. At least that's my, uh, my, my optimistic interpretation. So the whole endeavor of looking at subjects makes sense 
this splitting, the heart splittings are resolvable by the coagulum plasma. Um, I should mention there, there are some caveats with this measurement. Uh, it, it's not absolutely normalized, but uh, let's, uh, let's ignore that for the time being. Um, there are more recent measurements, uh, which are, uh, I think, somewhat uh, uh, more advanced because they're absolutely normalized, they are unfolded. Um, and they get around the caveat of the CMS measurement, which means that the angle between the two subjects that you reconstruct in CMS has to be greater than 0.1 radian, because otherwise they are not uh, separated uh, because of the granularity of the uh, calorimeter towers. Um, this is a measurement based on charged jets constructed from charged particle tracks, and there you have no such, uh, such uh, granularity constraint. So this is, an, in, in a certain sense, um, a more advanced measurement, but it also is a slightly different measurement. And here we look at both um, as a function of the angle between them, I mean, uh, theta g, which is rg divided by the radius parameter, and again as a function of cg. And uh, you see that there is a sort of a evolution here, uh, including a sign change uh, from an enhancement to a suppression at some uh, uh, value of this angle. Um, there's maybe less of an effect uh, as a function of CG than uh, CMS has seen. Um, quickly, we can also look at uh, the jet mass distributions um, with different settings of the grooming parameter. We can either cut out uh, soft uh, contributions um, with a threshold that is constant in, uh, in angle, or we can uh, uh, set this better parameter to 1.5, which gets you a sort of an, a cut where the momentum, uh, uh, minimum momentum required increases as you go further to the periphery of the, of the jet. And you see that if you, have, if you have this cut such that you only look at the core of the jet, sort of the hard subjects uh, that are uh, really uh, near the center, um, there's no change. So the core is essentially unmodified in terms of jet mass. If you go to this flat cut, there is a, a modification that you see at large jet masses, something to keep in mind. Actually, don't keep it in mind because I have a summary in a moment. And uh, that, is, uh, that is shown here. So uh, here, this is uh, the jet mass measurement uh, in, a, in a sort of a phase space spanned by the angle between the two jets and the minimum momentum of the contributing subjects. Um, and again, uh, this is a representation that follows what uh, E. Chen has shown uh, uh, in the past, for example, at last uh, quark matter. Um, so if you make this cut that uh, uh, just requires a, a, a flat cut in CG, then uh, uh, you get an enhancement of large jet masses. If you focus just on the core of the jet um, by uh, going to smaller, smaller, by increasing the momentum cut for, a smaller, for larger angles, you get no change. Okay, so that's a summary of what we just saw. Um, we can put uh, uh, an Alice measurement of the, the CG on there, where if we average over the full range of uh, angles between the two jets, um, we essentially get no change in the yield as a function of a CG. Um, but what we can also do is we can split the, the angular range into uh, 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 small angle difference component and the uh, large angle difference uh, component. Here in the small uh, angle difference component, we get an enhancement, and here we get a, we get a depletion. So in this plane, we can visualize uh, the effects of uh, many different uh, measurements on top of each other. And uh, one conclusion is that um, uh, this, this, this really depends on which angular region of the jet uh, or the, uh, between the subjects you look at. And a lot of the change that you see really is related to the large angle and low momentum region. And I hope that sounds uh, somewhat familiar. And this is also corroborated by other measurements um, like this Atlas measurements where uh, they uh, construct r equals one jets by reclustering uh, a lot uh, neighboring r equals 0.2 jets of 35 GeV. So it's a very special population of r equals 0.1 jets. And obviously they lack all the soft components and without the soft part, their RIA is essentially the same as that of smaller jets. There's no increase in RIA. So this again points to the fact that it's really a modifications of the soft constituents of the jets that make uh, the difference here. 
Um, there's another measurement from Alice. I'm not going to go into uh, details here, but um, um, this is a measurement of how many uh, of these uh, soft drop ste steps where you go to the hardest jet and then throw away the soft stuff. How often can you do that uh, sequentially following the branch of the hardest subject until it is gone? And that uh, they call number of soft drop uh, uh, steps. And uh, you see that this number of soft drop steps gets enhanced. Uh, so the, the, the low number, uh, the jets for which you can do that only very few times, gets enhanced in uh, lead lead compared to PP. And again, that is a sign that it is the soft part of the, of the jet that is uh, uh, most affected by the, by the quenching and not the, not the core. So all of these, uh, uh, I mean, there's more, um, more work needed, but uh, this is starting to hang together and it is connected to what we have learned uh, about jets uh, also uh, from looking at the, the constituent uh, based measurements. So this is, a, a, I think there's a lot of work to do, but I think the, this is a prom promising direction for the future. But as you probably have noticed, um, really understanding how all these different measurements of jet substructure uh, relate to each other uh, is quite challenging. Okay, so let me just uh, spend two more minutes and then I'm, I'm going to be done on uh, the future, which is uh, very exciting. Um, we are now right here, sort of in terms of jet physics in a, a little bit of a, of a try dry spell in terms of new data because the, the LHC is shut down at the moment. It's a long shutdown too, um, where a lot of work is going on in particular for the ALICE experiment. It's uh, uh, on the tracker side, it's completely revamped. There's uh, also extensions on the calorimeter side. And most importantly, ALICE is going to emerge as a much, much faster, two orders of magnitude faster experiment after LS2 and will be on the, on the jet and uh, uh, rare probe side really be, be working on equal footing with uh, the uh, CMS and ATLAS uh, experiments while retaining many of its, uh, of its strength. So the, at the LHC experimentally will be much stronger uh, after, uh, after the end of LS2 and with the next uh, lead lead learn probably somewhere in late, late 22. I mean, that's all schedules. This is of course in, in some sort of, in some, uh, uh, in a state of some flux at the moment. And then we'll have run three and we'll over, uh, overall between the experiments collect at least an order of magnitude more data than we have uh, so far in the first 10 years. And that really should uh, bring us uh, in, uh, together with the enhanced experimental capabilities, um, a big step forward. And of course at RIC, uh, exciting things are happening as well. S Phoenix is now under construction will be installed in 22 and start data, data taking in 23. Um, at uh, the LHC, we'll get an order of magnitude more data plus enhanced instrumentation uh, compared to sort of the typical data sets that we have at RIC. S Phoenix will actually bring more than an order of magnitude um, for some measurements or factors of 20 or 50 more data than we have so far, plus uh, enhanced uh, uh, experimental capabilities on the tracking and calorimeter side. Um, so let me just point out, Alice really is doing a, a lot of uh, um, uh, a complete renovation of the, of the experiment. Um, Atlas and uh, CMS, their big uh, um, upgrades will come after run three, but even for run three, we will be, uh, we'll have many improvements that also will help for heavy iron physics. And then here, let me end by um, saying a few things about S Phoenix. It's an experiment that uh, um, combines sort of uh, many ideas from uh, uh, Atlas and CMS in terms of calorimetry with ideas from Alice in terms of the tracking. And uh, as I said, we'll have much higher statistics than we had at RIC before. For the first time, it will have a hadronic uh, calorimeter and uh, very high precision uh, uh, um, uh, vertexing from uh, a three-layer uh, maps-based microvertex detector, and uh, we have uh, so we, we are quite ambitious in, in designing this, but also trying to make sure that it can be brought online uh, uh, shortly. And we are now only a, um, a year and a half away from installation and two and a half years away from uh, first data. Um, let me just prove that this doesn't just doesn't not only exist as uh, this engineering drawing. But many of the pieces that we will uh, put, start putting together in 
just a little bit over a year, um, actually are already sitting in uh, storage areas at, at Brookhaven waiting to be uh, 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 equipped and assembled. This is the hadronic calorimeter. This is a piece of the electromagnetic calorimeter. These are uh, the readout chambers for the TPC and then various uh, electronics and micro vertex detector components. So a, a very exciting uh, uh, time for the collaboration, obviously made uh, more challenging by uh, the various uh, lockdowns, travel restrictions and so on. It's a very exciting time for, for everybody. Um, and uh, one thing uh, which I didn't have time to uh, mention here in detail, but one thing that I really hope is that we will be able to combine the data from LHC and RIC for jet observables, for example, using the, the uh, Bayesian approaches pioneered by some members of Jetscape to really study the temperature dependence of observables and the dependence on the on the specific uh, parameters of the coagulant plasma at the two collision energies in detail to learn something about the, uh, the evolution and uh, the structure at specific scales or specific temperatures. Okay, and that is, uh, brings me to the summary. And I hope, uh, I hope I'm still connected because I haven't heard anything from Volker in a while. So uh, summary, a key goal of uh, hot QCD is to understand the microscopic structure of the QGP and how its unique and fascinating long wavelengths properties emerge from the underlying uh, at, uh, uh, large uh, momentum transfers asymptotically free gauge theory. The toolkit of jet observables, and I hope I have given you an impression of the, the breadth and, the, and the, the amount of content of this toolkit uh, plays really an essential role there. There has been an enormous growth in quantity and depth of jet measurements. As I said, this was about a third of the slides that I started out with. Growth always comes with some growing pain. We need to carefully evaluate the experimental consistency, the relation between different observables. We have to decide if we really are doing precision physics or not. And we also have to learn on the theory side. And again, there Jetscape plays a key role whether we can actually exploit uh, this uh, explosion in the number of observables and uh, whatever we achieve in terms of ex uh, increased precision. Um, as I said, there are irreducible uh, effects uh, in the physics, say from hadronization and from the underlying event. Um, and we need to understand whether we can do this extrapolation from the jets to the parton shower in the face of these uh, lossy transformations that uh, uh, we go through in both directions. And uh, this is a very pressing problem as uh, run three and uh, the new era at RIC are approaching because uh, we will get, make an, uh, a, qu a qualitative step forward in, uh, in the precision and uh, statistics and uh, breadth of uh, observables. And uh, we need to be ready to actually make a sense of all of that. And again, Jetscape should really play an essential role in that and uh, bring uh, theorists and experimentalists together. And over this time, next decade, much effort will be required to make a connection of what we can measure to what we can learn about the QGP structure. And uh, that's the end of uh, the presentation. And as I said, I hope I'm still connected. Yes, you are. Okay, that's very good. Um, so there are no more questions. The students have been active while you were talking, answering the okay, questions themselves. So actually you taught them something. So from the questions from the Slack channel, I have nothing to report. So okay. I think Lauren should take over as the chair. Okay, it's 12.30 uh, uh, a.m. here. So uh, actually I lied to uh, Abhijit, he was correct about the time difference. I was confused. <laughs> but uh, I'm confused a lot these days uh, yeah. uh, given my sleep schedule. Okay, um, if there are no, no questions. Uh, Lauren, Lauren I, or I, whoever is chairing officially this whole outfit. I'm, I'm ready to have a drink oh. and go to bed. Hi, this is Lauren. So um, I think we can take questions if there's some questions, but otherwise I, I think we can wrap up. Or Christine, are you back? So how do you want to do this? You want to raise hands now for questions because the, the, the Slack channel is taken care of. Okay, very good. I, I'll have to have a look at that and, this, and learn something for myself. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, as I was saying, um, you know, if you asked a question in the Slack channel and I see that, you know, while 
many people have answered the questions. If your question is still not answered, then only then raise your hand. Ah. Raise your hand in the Zoom. Does it automatically promote you to, to the top of the participant list? Yeah, it should. Yep, there we are. And uh, just, just should I do it, or Lauren, you want to do it? Do you? I think you should go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So I there's a question from Aditya Prasad. So I'm going to unmute you, and you can ask your question. Uh, hello, ahead. sir. Uh, can you elaborate on uh, the uh, on the aspects of machine learning in jet physics and what are its uh, opportunities uh, using that approach? Uh, what is the uh, what are the opportunities in research in that? Um, okay, so let's uh, let's go back to uh, this slide. Let me move the participant window out of the way. Um, okay, so I mean, this is one particular. Um, uh, approach of uh, how we um, how we try to make uh, optimal use of the information uh, uh, that is uh, that is available to us and uh, as I said uh, um, the standard procedure of how the background subtraction is done um, by construction is very uh, agnostic it is designed such that it works uh, regardless of what particular shape uh, the jet has, it just uh, takes a, a constant background and uh, subtracts that and whatever is left over, that's what we call uh, the jet. A little more, bit more complicated than that, but that is the, the essence of it. Um, I think that has an, an advantage in that it, um, uh, in that it is uh, uh, unbiased against modifications of the jet but it has a disadvantage that it doesn't take into account a lot of the things that we know about the jets. We know that uh, by construction, they have a, have a hard core and uh, then uh, uh, not so much energy out, spread out uh, very far. We know something about what the uh, fragmentation structure looks like. And in the normal procedure, that information is really not taken into account. Um, machine learning algorithms, however, are very good at uh, being fed all the information, uh, prior information that you have about what a jet should actually look like, and then uh, uh, using that information in an optimal way to provide an estimator of uh, some, uh, um, some desired uh, um, uh, target value that uh, uh, is better than uh, an algorithm can do if it doesn't have that information. Um, so, and that is uh, something, so this is, a, um, I think, a new application of machine learning in, uh, in this particular uh, aspect of heavy iron reconstruction. However, one, sh one needs to realize that uh, in PP collisions and also in some aspects of heavy ions, we have been using machine learning algorithms uh, all the time to uh, um, really uh, make optimal use in, uh, in distinguishing uh, signal and background. Uh, for example, um, many of the CMS heavy iron, uh, open heavy flavor um, results, use uh, mach machine learning to uh, uh, optimally uh, distinguish um, real uh, B, uh, B uh, uh, hadron decays from a, a combinatorial background. Um, actually in the CMS track reconstruction, we use machine learning to uh, optimally combine the cuts that select the good tracks from uh, bad tracks. And in PP, I think the, by now in proton-proton collisions, algorithm uh, analyses that uh, uh, do not use uh, machine learning in any aspect of their reconstruction, uh, they are probably in the minority. So this is a, a standard technique. But every time you uh, apply it to something new, you have to be very careful to make sure that the additional information that you give it uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't really uh, doesn't bias. Uh, the outcome against some of the physics that you might be interested in, but uh, that the algorithm then uh, decides uh, um, not to take into account. And uh, so that's one, th one way this can go wrong. The other way that it can go wrong is that your algorithm becomes uh, too smart and uh, uh, it figures out uh, uh, how to, for example, in, uh, when you do heavy flavor reconstruction and uh, you give your algor algorithm a lot of um, 
uh, potential for learning, um, sometimes uh, that it, uh, it uh, figures out how, con how to make cuts that construct uh, uh, nice uh, B mesons out of a uh, uh, combinatorial background and uh, uh, usually enhances your signal with stuff that looks like uh, the real decays, but is actually the result of a, a very, very complicated uh, cut space that your artificial neural network, if it's deep enough, can assemble. So these algorithms are powerful, but you really have to understand in, in, in detail and probably in more detail than we do now for this application, what exactly it is they are selecting on and uh, how that is connected to uh, variations in the physics that you're interested in. Um, the nice thing is that uh, because this has so many applications outside of physics, there are uh, extremely well-developed uh, toolkits for that, uh, that uh, anybody can go and, and, uh, and run and play with it themselves. So I, I think for the students, I highly recommend uh, playing with that. If you have some experience in, in, uh, in programming, uh, getting started with uh, scikit-learn in Python or TMVA in, in root is, uh, is not very difficult. And I think uh, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. Okay, long answer to a short question. Any uh, anything else I can uh, uh, I can try to take a take a stab at? Uh, I think that um, uh, Aditya can can follow up with you on Slack. Um, okay. Is there anybody else who had a Slack question uh, that was not addressed in the Slack or was addressed in the Slack? Sorry and. You are not no, no, there, are two, there are two Slack questions popping up. How do you identify a chat as quark-like or gluon-like in experiment? Ah, so that's um, so that is a is a good question, and it is a very old and important question um, because it is relevant for discovery physics in in proton-proton uh, collisions. Um, I mean, there, if you if you look for some particular. Uh, uh, decay of uh, some beyond st of uh, particles in some beyond standard physics uh, uh, models. So you want to make a discovery that gets you a, a Nobel Prize. You really want to push the uh, discriminating power uh, of your observable of your measurement uh, as much as you can. And uh, you, if your model predicts that uh, your particle decays into into quarks, then you want to make sure that uh, you don't just uh, look at inclusive jets, but you want to in the, in, the, in the reconstruction, you want to only use quark jets and not the gluon jets. So quark-gluon discrimination is really something that on the PP side is, um, uh, is a key question for discovery physics. And uh, um, then what you do when you have something like this, you build uh, taggers, where each uh, tagger, uh, focuses on, uh, where tagger focuses on some particular aspect of what makes gluon jets look uh, different than, uh, than quark jets. And I have... Um, uh, to illustrate that, let's go to, um, where's the slide? Just a sec. Uh, I know it is here somewhere. Yep. Okay, you use properties like this, for example, which here looks at the fragmentation function of uh, gluon jets, uh, quark jets, and then uh, sort of the inclusive jets. And uh, uh, for, for a given, uh, um, in photon jet events uh, with a given selection of uh, photon and uh, jet PT. And what you see is that, so this is, uh, uh, these are the soft fragments. When you look at this size uh, observable, these are the soft low PT fragments, and these are the hard fragments. So what you see is that the uh, quark jets uh, have more hard high PT fragments constituents than gluon jets, uh, whereas gluon jets have more constituents overall and more soft constituents. So if you have your jet, then one way uh, to distinguish between uh, quark and gluon jets is that on average, uh, the gluon jets are, um, have less hard component, more soft component and more particles. Um, that is uh, correlated with uh, this uh, thing, the jet charge, which uh, shows that the gluon jets are on average also wider which makes sense because the soft uh, particles tend to sit further uh, away from the jet axis. And of course, each of these, uh, um, each of these uh, features is uh, 
in itself does not allow you to get, get a, a sharp cut between quarks and gluons. And there are probably others that, that one could uh, dig out. So what you do is you again, try to combine these features and um, the width, the number of particles, the number of hard fragments, the number of soft fragments, the mean PT of the fragments, you try to combine them in an optical, optimal way, which these days you would typically do with a machine learning algorithm, I don't know, a boosted decision tree or an uh, artificial neural network. And from, with that, you can get a, a combined tagger with some discrimination power between uh, uh, quarks and gluons, just based on the fact that they fragment in uh, somewhat uh, different ways. And you can train your tagger either by um, uh, uh, checking the performance of one or the other feature against another, or by going to events that you know are dominated by uh, quark or gluon jets. For example, if you look at, um, I don't know if that is actually done, but uh, in principle, it's a possibility. If you look at the initial or final state radiation, so third jets in a, in a, uh, in a uh, digest event, so you look at the back-to-back, uh, not quite back-to-back -back jets with the third jet in the event, that third jet is most likely a gluon. So you can check whether um, your tagger uh, identifies that correctly. Whereas on the other hand, if you go to uh, um, photon jet or C jet events, um, they are more likely to be quarks. So your, uh, the performance of your tagger should reflect that. So it's very important to uh, be able to control the properties of uh, such algorithms based on data and uh, that's uh, that plays into what I said, but um, the quark gluon discrimination is based on a combination of uh, uh, features where each feature has a weak discriminating power, but you combine all of them together, you can actually win quite uh, significantly. And there was another question. Yeah, well, the question is whether we go, we go further or not, right? I mean, uh... well, I'm, I typically go to bed sort of at uh, between two and three a.m. So I'm happy to stay around for another hour and a half. I don't have anything better to do here other than watch uh, Netflix. So uh, th let's ask the boss, the boss Abhijit. So what shall we do? Well, since I don't hear anything, I want to read at least one because it's a little bit broader than just your talk. It hits to the heart of a, a jetscape. So in, in the earlier theory talk, in the earlier theory talk, we learned that the fragmentation functions are rarely implemented in event generators can we study about jet fragmentations in the Jetscape framework? So this is not necessarily to you, Gunther, but it's to the entire group of Jetscape honchos. That's a, that's a very good question. I have, a, um, I of course, have an opinion about that, but well, we I'm would not like the one to hear it. who would figure out how to implement it. But I think, as we see here in this plot, right plot for the question, the fragmentation functions really contain key information uh, about what is going on in particular, this low PT enhancement, which is um, one of the reasons that we now talk a lot about medium response um, is seen uh, among other measurements in these fragmentation functions. So not being able to um, say anything about that, I think would be a serious uh, deficiency. Of course, how you implement that, that uh, uh, the physics that leads to this consistently in, uh, in Jetscape uh, that's uh, for other people to figure out. Yeah, so let me just jump in at this point. Um, I was uh, trying to unmute my microphone the last time. Uh, this is really one of the, the the largest, I think, or most important topics that, that people in Jetscape have been working on. Uh, if you look inside uh, the Jetscape, uh, the hydronization folder that you know, you, you know, James is showing you these different folders. You'll find that there are three different hydronization routines. That is, you know, the, the colored, colorless, and then the, the hybrid hydronization. So one, so you know, one is just, or two of them are just extensions of how Pythia would have hadronized a jet. Then there is recombination-based hydronization as we come down in PT. Beyond that, there is also the, what you'll learn about later uh, in this week is about what we call the liquefier module, which considers jets which have dissipated energy into the medium. And then the medium, uh, it then hadronizes, right? It's still correlated with the jet. So yes, you can, there's a lot of work going on in this direction in Jetscape and, and that's something that everybody can, can, can participate in if you wanted to. Um, 
Let me just swing back and say, we were supposed to stop at 12. It is now 12.45. I think we should let Gunther watch his Netflix <laughs> and okay. maybe call it a day. <laughs> uh, but I'm beginning to notice a, a, a pattern of how, uh, how we can deal with a lot of questions here. And I think this is something we can continue, which is you ask your question on Slack, you see immediately a bunch of people agreeing with you by giving you thumbs up. And then a whole other bunch of people start answering your question already while the talk is going on. And mm -hmm. then we sort of come back to the questions which are sort of outstanding at the end of, of, of each of these sessions. And Gunther, I would encourage you to go look at the Slack section on the section uh, with your name on it. And mm -hmm. you'll see a lot of discussion that took place while, 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 while you were speaking. Okay. Yeah. I encourage you to that's contribute. A, to that's, very, that's very interesting. I'll have a look uh, later. Um, just as a remark, so as I said, it's nicer to meet in person because it's fun to meet all your friends and talk, uh, talk about all sorts of things. But uh, there's actually something to be said for these, uh, the Zoom meetings. I think the technology really gives you options that you don't have if everybody is sitting in a room, uh, unless uh, people are sitting in a room and uh, uh, have their laptops open. But uh, uh, somehow in in-person meetings, laptops that are open are usually really a distraction. Here, the, uh, having uh, access to multiple communication channels seems to be a um, um, uh, uh, positive feature. So I think we're really learning a lot about how to do this uh, properly, uh, not, by, not by choice, but by necessity. No, I agree. I mean, there's a lot of information that's coming in from different directions. People are citing papers and, and you know, other things on the web. Um, we started with 170 participants. We are now down to 101. I think we are losing parts of the world. That's a, that's uh, a message there. So, okay. <laughs> I think it's just getting late. All right. So I want to thank Gunther again uh, okay, and, and Reiner awesome. for excellent talks. And thank you to all the chairs uh, for keeping the session together uh, nice. so well. Um, Volker is clapping his hands. Okay. Sorry. I thought that was a raised hand. Um, all right. I think that's it. So Jorn, you can shut down the meeting now and we will see everybody tomorrow again at 9 a.m. Eastern time uh, for, the, for the hydrodynamics and um, cascade sessions. All right. Bye everybody.